We're live, but does it switch me over to four by three? Here's the moment of truth. We check, waiting. Oh, nice. We stayed at 16 by nine. I don't know what's going on with these aspect ratios and Facebook, but they are spicy about it. Good morning. Welcome to Friday. As happens every Friday when I'm here in town, usually I do a live show. And as every live show starts, it begins these days with me griping about uh, aspect ratios. This is the only live show slash podcast where we have the balls to force our audience to listen to live on air gripes about aspect ratios. You don't hear that in other podcasts. Have you noticed that? And have you noticed sort of feeling like that sucks? I want to hear more gripes about aspect ratios. I'm someone that has an opinion about an aspect ratio. Why isn't anyone talking about this? Well, here's the place where we do that. Now that's done though. So we're going to move past that. Um, it's our last live show. Oh, see, I'm wearing a scarf today. It's a rather lovely silk scarf, but it's got, they put the tag, they sew the tag right on there and I want to remove it. Can I just pull it? Oh, I've, I've, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to cut it with a scissor. I'm sure there's people watching that were just like, don't do that. Oh my God, he did it. He just pulled at it. And now that's going to fray. He's cut it off, but it, I've done, I've, irreparably damaged the fabric, the delicate fabric of this scarf. Hopefully that'll be all right. Whatever. We'll just learn to live with it. Um, so uh, we've got some tea and we've got some topics. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things today. I'm going to share uh, about what integration is looking like for me this week. I'll share a little bit about my experience in ceremony. And I also want to talk about integration as a concept and how that pertains to any transformational work, be it transformational coaching, deep, deep, powerful therapy, maybe some Tony Robbins events, maybe put a maybe around that ayahuasca experience, all of that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and, and how that plays out for us. And talk about the agenda I have for all of these conversations. Someone has asked me, they said in all caps, when I asked who has topics they'd like me to talk about, someone said, please talk about uprooted people that are isolated like me and don't feel at home anywhere. So I don't really know where that topic is going to lead us, but I'll, I'll see what I generate from that. Uh, it's a very broad, open topic someone has given me. You know, like there's no sort of, can you talk about how to address that? Or I feel stuck in this way. It's just like, just talk about it. Okay, I'll just talk about it. We'll see what comes from that. It's going to be a grab bag. And then I'm going to talk about like our capacity to be open and I'm going to talk about how to become receptive and sensitive to feedback. And so in a way, how to learn to start reading the YouTube comments counter to the prevailing wisdom. Don't read the YouTube comments. And we'll talk about that. And, and that'll probably tie in with those stages of openness. There's some real gold there. We want to talk about how to actually get the gold that's available to us. Here's our first simultaneous sip, mugs up, as my friend, the other member of Team Adam says on his live show. I have one of my best friends is named Adam as well, which is awesome. And we form Team Adam. And then his son is named Adam Jr. So that's the third member of Team Adam. It's a very powerful triumvirate that we've created thus far. If your name is also Adam, then you can apply for membership. It's very exclusive starting with the name rec requirement and, and we'll see. We are considering applications, but it's a tight crew and you might not get in. So um, last week we were down in Costa Rica. We were working with the medicine of ayahuasca ourselves and we were supporting people. I was teaching uh, about five days out of my time there. So quite a bit I was working and then also doing some counseling, supporting people in their process throughout their week. It was a tremendous week, incredible week. And the, the, about a month and a half ago when I'd gone down to do this work, I came back uh, really present to like a lot of my gluttony. I think I'd shared about this and how I was releasing that. And so it felt very clear coming back into this process of integration where things are like settling back down after having them all kicked up. It felt very clear to me what there was to do, which was create a lot of spaciousness for myself, let myself sit in the moment. Uh, don't try to do too much. Slow down, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This time coming back, a lot of the theme of my work has been continuing that arc. And some of what I brought 
to my process was uh, help me continue the healing arc I'm on. So help me continue to let go of things, release what's not serving me, blah, 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 blah. Help me get clear on what's next for me. And the message that I got really clearly from within was just keep surrendering for now. It's not that there's not going to be a time when there's more stuff to do, but right now what there is to do is to just surrender. And so, uh, you know, I, I got the embodied experience of practicing that and, and had a lot of sort of um, what we might call, hey, Seth, nice to see you. And uh, Daniel, good question. I'm going to ask that. I'll answer that in a question or in a sec. Um, and so like coming from that place of practicing surrender, there was a lot of like, not much mind involved, meaning I would get sort of an experience of like moving something through my body, but I'd have no real clear idea of what it was. And further, I was pretty clear for myself. Oh, the practice, just don't worry about that. Release it. Cause that's the essence of surrender. You know, one of the first ways we resist surrender is we try to make sense of everything. Why do I feel so sad right now? Have you ever heard yourself ask that question? Why am I so sad? Why am I sad? I don't understand. That's a resistance to simply being sad. Because what's happening is the mind is trying to make sense of your sadness and get its, its hands around it. Because then if you can understand it, you can contain it. And then it's sort of like this conditional, I'll start to feel sad. I'll let myself feel sad if I understand why. Because if I understand why, then I'll have a rationality and it'll all be predictable. And then I can be okay with what's happening and blah, 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 blah. And that's not how surrender works. That's actually resistance to surrender. And so a lot of a lot of my process this past week has been simply surrendering. Let whatever's coming over me come over me, allow that to be, and then let the process be the process that I'm moving through. So it was a beautiful week, a beautiful opportunity to practice. It provided me a lot. But what I'm finding really challenging this week is Hey, Ilya, 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 I'm saying it right. Coming home from my time in ceremony and going into the process of integrating all of this has been very challenging for me because this time coming home, I don't have a clear path laid out in front of me. The, the, the medicine that I got, the, the, my medicine to work with was really like surrender, keep surrendering. And so I've come home and been like, okay, what do I do? What is there for me to take on? What do I need to put in place? And you know, there's some, there's like well-being stuff that I put in place. Like, okay, let's make sure I've got fresh cut up fruit in my fridge. So I, as a practice, I always have cut up cantaloupe in my fridge now, because if I don't, I'm going to reach for candy. I'm going to eat sweets. As long as I have some cantaloupe or something like that in the fridge, then I'll eat that. And then it, it, it meets my body's sugar craving. So that really supports me. So I have practices like that that are set up. But I don't have like a big, you know, thing like do this or let go of that. It's more just be in the moment and surrender to the moment. And I've struggled with that. And so what I notice has been in my space energetically this week has been like some resistance and a little bit of frantic energy, like enjoying video games, playing video games, and then reaching the point where I'm getting frustrated that I'm not doing something right, or my opponent's being a dink, or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then rather than honor, like, oh, I'm frustrated, and what I should probably do is go meditate, or go sit outside, I just like, nope, fuck that, I'm going to keep doing that. So just being in resistance to surrender. And what I want to distinguish here is that that's part of my process. So the the, the typical thing we do in these situations is we we hold it over ourselves. I'm doing it wrong. I'm fucking up. I'm, I'm not honoring my process. I should be doing more. I should be doing less. I'm not doing this the right way. You know, all of that mental churn, none of which actually supports us, none of which actually has us go anywhere. It just has us berate ourselves for how we're showing up. And the practice for me is to recognize that is my process. I actually have to... Like if what is happening for me right now is I'm sitting down, I'm somewhat conscious of what there is for me to do and I'm resistant to it, then that's the process that I'm moving through and allow myself to be in all of that. Because if I can allow myself to do that softly, then I can start to notice and study myself. Hey, how's it going when I'm doing that? Well, I feel kind of shitty and annoyed and it's harder for me to sleep. I don't sleep as well. Okay, great. Next time it comes around, I might have a little more spaciousness to make a different choice. So I'm 
noticing my resistance. I'm noticing the places where like surrender would be an option. I'm noticing the places where I'm not willing to. I'm studying how I show up in those moments and on and on and on and on. So I can say all that intellectually. You know, I can distinguish that and I'm pretty good at distinguishing things, but like the practice of it is tough. And accompanying that I've noticed this week, I felt, I have felt myself, maybe other people have felt this too, probably, I don't know, but I have felt short and impatient and irritable with people. Irascible, we might say. It's a word I like a lot. Irascible is kind of like a, like a, you know, like a, a wombat, like a rodent that's like very like, like an, an angry raccoon, irascible. So I've been kind of irascible. Bay said a few times, hey, your energy feels a little bit, a little bit sharp. Or like we were out for dinner and she was like, you feel a little spicy maybe with the serving staff. I don't know if there's something there for you. And um, and I've been resistant to acknowledging that truth. And so here I am in a moment of vulnerability, sharing this deep truth, vulnerability alert. I've been kind of a dink <laughs> this week. And um, being a dink is not the, there's a better way for me to express that. Really the truth is just, a, I've, I've been feeling short and irritable and irascible. And so uh, I don't really know what that's about or what that means. What I know is that that's what there, hey Maria, that's what there is for me to be with and to just study myself and to surrender. Okay, I'm irritable and I'm not willing to let go right now. And I'm like tightened around something. What I do know is anytime we have a process of like releasing stuff, inevitably on the other side of that, we're going to have a process of increased clutching at stuff. And that's just the nature of an expansion and contraction. Like the way we stretch a muscle, the way we stretch a rubber band is we expand it and then we have to let it shrink back down a little bit before we extend it more and then let it shrink. Oh boy. Thank you. Someone rang our bell and exploded my dog. I'm just going to let my dog out to guard the house. Go Grimby, go. And then we're back. So, so given I've had this week of like deep release, deep surrender, of course, coming back, I'm going to have like more resistance to doing so. Hell no. I'm not going to stop playing video games. Hell no. Blah, blah, blah. So that's a lot of how my integrative process has been going so far this week. And I'm doing my best. Like this is helpful. Even just sort of sharing it in this moment, putting it out on loudspeaker. I'm doing my best to hold it with a lot of grace and to give myself permission to be where I am at. And, um, uh, and it's not easy. It's not easy. So I want to talk a little bit more about integration and that process in general. Before I do, I'll share two other things. Uh, and I'm going to come to Daniel, your question. And um, I love your random ask, Maria. And I'm going to come to that too after that. And the two things I will share is, um, I notice every time I come back from like deep transformational work, so be it work with my coach, work I'm leading in Costa Rica, or when I'm working with the medicine myself, you, you get him, Grimby? You barked him out? Yeah, I barked him. He's gone. He'll never come back. The power of my barking. Yeah, and you can come back up on the chair if you want. Uh, guard dog here at 6274. Um... Every time I do this work, I notice I come back and I slay at pickleball and Street Fighter. So my my progress in these these activities, these sports and these esports that I play, grows every time I take on my own work. And part of what I attribute to that that to is that every time I take on transformation, I create more space for myself, and I become a little more friendly and gracious with my own process. And what that does is it allows me to learn at my pace without getting frustrated that I'm not learning fast enough or that I'm not learning the right way. And so it allows things to just kind of integrate and fall into place faster for me. And so it's kind of cool. Um, whilst there's a whole bunch of stuff that's really challenging right now and I'm kind of irritable and frustrating, playing pickleball last night and playing Street Fighter over the course of this week has been like these moments of like, you know, little, little stars that the universe puts there to be like, don't worry, look, there's a bright star indicating some of your progress. You're, you're doing good work. Keep it up. Like, okay, cool. At least I'm a diamond three rank in Street Fighter. And soon I will be master rank. And then I will be a master certified coach and a master certified Street Fighter player. And then the stars will align. And I think then life will be really easy for me. That's, that's my belief. 
And if not, then maybe it's just getting to like a five level of, of playing pickleball. And then, then I think it'll, it'll all be easy. <laughs> uh, so Daniel, you ask, have I ever experimented with fasting? I have not experimented with fasting beyond, um, I was working with a shaman out this way where I live for about a year. And part of my process with her was towards the end of it, I did a vision fast. Um, a vision fast, at least with the lineage of medicine she worked in, which was a lot of Coast Salish, a lot of First Nations here on the West Coast. The vision fast was, um, there was a bunch of preparation around it, starting with a medicine walk before that, like weeks before. And then we went off to this location. I found, we had a couple of days kind of preparing for the ceremony. And then I went and found a spot where I was isolated, just myself. I stayed in a eight foot diameter um, circle of cornmeal, basically creating a barrier between myself and the spirit world. And for four days, I had three liters of water and nothing else. I had a tarp, I had a sleeping bag, and that was it. No journal to take notes, really nothing to distract myself. And so over the course of those four days, we fasted and, or I fasted rather, and, uh, and uh, it was probably the most challenging thing I've ever had to do because what was so challenging for me was, you know, working with my coach, being in big intensive transformational leadership programs, working with ayahuasca, all of these things are challenging because it's like, ah, I'm being forced to face something I don't want to face. The same thing was held true with the vision fast, but what I was being forced to face was nothingness, my boredom stillness and spaciousness and so rather you could think like wow four days just relax my mind went crazy that was super challenging and because you're fasting you're not eating food well food is stimulative food gives us like it, it breaks boredom it creates a difference in our experience in the moment and so without that there's even more just stillness and time slowed down to a crawl through that time so there's, there's teachers I work with now who do s similar fasts, but they like, they drink ayahuasca. They, they sit in ceremony for the evenings and they come back and fast by themselves. And, and I'm like that, that seems more the, the direction I would be called in at this point. I'm, I'm very, the Yahe, which is the Colombian medicine of ayahuasca I work with. It, I'm very committed to um, the Yahe as my teacher. I'm a student of the Yahe, we would say, in my lineage. Good question, Daniel. Have you, have you ever experimented with fasting, Daniel? And is there a different way you mean? Like, do you mean just like intermittent fasting or stuff like that? Uh, I'll share. There's like a lot of people do intermittent fasting. And um, one of the reasons when I ask why is often like, uh, they say a bunch of sciencey stuff, but then usually it's to like lose weight or to stay lean. That's usually the, the reason that I hear underneath, like, well, because your body's processes and because blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, so all that happens, but why do you do it? Like, what's the purpose? And um, as of late, losing weight has fallen away for me entirely as, a, as a, an approach, because what has shifted for me is I've really healed a lot of the stuff over top of which I had learned to layer eating a lot of food to cope. So the way I kind of showed up in my life was I made sure to play sports and be active to ensure I didn't like put on a ton of weight and be unhealthy. But then at the same time, I would eat a lot of junk food and like my, my eating tended to be kind of gluttonous. And so it was like managed and which allowed me to, um, to sort of maintain a baseline, but I was always like a little bit like that gluttony kind of made itself, it showed up for me. And so um, as I've healed the thing underneath that, there's just been less call to eat, to eat a lot. I, I find myself eating more often just when I'm hungry. And it's not because I'm actively like exerting willpower. I'm not actively like, don't eat that food. Don't eat that food. Think about how good it's going to feel when you lose your weight. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I've just addressed the thing underneath that had me reach for food in the first place to comfort me, 
So as you heal that underlying wound, eating the food stops being so compelling. There's just not really a need. Just like if you had learned to like go like this three times before you left a room because you were afraid, you had a story that if you didn't do that, a monster would eat your head, you know, give me some liberty here. Then if we address the story where the monster, like you eliminated that story that the monster would eat your head, you'd no longer feel called to do that. You would just stop doing it. And so that's that's kind of how that has shown up for me. That's not exactly what you're talking about, but that's worth sharing, I think, as, as far as my food's concerned. And he's doing it to keep patterns disciplined. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's a great, you know, I have so many areas in my own life of practice where <laughs> they're really supporting me to like, to honor discipline and to hold structure for myself that I don't need to add another one. But um, but that's a, it's a great reason, like, you know, sometimes just meditating for the simple fact that it provides a daily structure is valuable in and of itself can really heal us. Hey, Andy, by the way. Uh, everyone, Andy's got a new book out that you should check out too. Andy, can you post maybe the title of it? I think it was ARC. I can't remember the name of it, but he was sharing, he shared it with me and I've been busy and haven't had a chance to look it over, but he was saying it's basically like, the same concepts we talk about here, we talk about on, on the transformational leader, but applied in a selling context and framework. And Andy is just a phenomenal coach himself. So I think you guys would really enjoy checking it out. Um, if you're looking for like something to read on these, on these, uh, the connection playbook, there you go. Yeah. So check that book out. If you're looking for something, Andy's an awesome author, really love his work. And Daniel, you just finished a 40 day mixed fast, which included intermittent and a Daniel fast, a customized Daniel fast. And what for did you do that fast, Daniel? What was the, what was the call forward? Um, what, for what reason did you take on that fast? And Ilya is saying my vibration is so much higher when I fast. I'm fasting almost every other day now. It feels so good. Uh, awesome. Yeah. If it feels good, do it. It's that simple. I don't think these things have to be uh, more complicated than that. The way we make it complicated is we started, we try to create this objective rule that exists in reality. Well, then everyone should do this or, oh, but that person's not doing it and they seem to be happy. So maybe I should stop doing what I'm doing. Nah, you don't have to worry about any of that. If it feels good to you, do it. All there is for us to do is to study ourselves. So if you're feeling called towards a fast, great, fast, and then study yourself. And what I think is really important is that our studying of ourself goes beyond just the window in which we're putting on the practice. So a lot of people study themselves somewhat for like, you know, they'll do a 30 day juice cleanse and they'll study themselves for that 30 days. And then they're like, Oh, I'm so glad I'm done that. I can start eating again. And then they just go back into mindlessness. If you're going to do something like that, study yourself for the next two months afterwards, set up regular recurring structure to remind you, Hey, how are you feeling? How does things feel now? And like really practice being honest with yourself. Give yourself permission. Actually, I feel kind of like shit or I feel amazing still, or I'm feeling good, but I'm starting to doubt. My mind is starting to race. and I'm starting to wonder if, if what I thought I got out of that is actually legit. So the more we can kind of study as we are going through our process, especially after we've finished our process, the richer the medicine we will get from whatever that process happens to be. And let's see what you wrote here, Maria. Random ask about meditation. When you started, did you find it comforting and absolutely tough to confronting? I think you said, right? Did you find it confronting and absolutely tough to do so? Hell yeah. I found it super annoying, like a waste of time. And I was doing it because I'm supposed to, I guess this will be good for me. People tell me I meant to meditate. So, uh, there was a time when I could not sit still. And one of the first, first, first conversations I ever had with one of my first, first, first coaches, she offered me the practice of like, just spend 15 minutes every day doing nothing. And it was so annoying. I was like, what an annoying practice. Way to waste my time, coach. You're meant to make me more productive and you're giving me this bullshit. This isn't going to work at all. And, uh, and so I did it because that's who I am, but I did it like resentfully. And then over time, I'd start to like fall asleep during that time. And I bring it to her and I'm like, it didn't work. I fell asleep. And she's like, huh? So you got to the point where you were relaxed enough to actually doze off. I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, that sounds kind of good. How did that feel? I'm like, I'm kind of relaxing, whatever. Anyhow, um, so for the longest time, I would meditate sporadically when I felt like I should. And then 
And then eventually I got to a point where I started to take on a regular practice. I really wanted to commit to a morning practice. And, um, and these days I find um, not only do I have that morning practice, but more and more and more I have the capacity to notice when I'm kind of speedy in my energy and to like go outside. I spend a lot of time these days sitting outside in my yard meditating there. And I almost always have a bit of resistance to doing it at first. And I almost always feel better and more spacious on the other side of doing it. And I'm starting to discover, I'm learning about myself that I've spent a lot of my life, uh, like kind of flooded, filled up with, with uh, stimulation. And like, there's just not been much space. I've been very densely packed in. And the more I keep engaging in my own work, the more I'm starting to discover a how incredible it is, how much I've been able to create given how densely packed in I've been like this being has been pretty blocked up and I've still managed to create a lot. And then I'm learning over time how much more I can create when I allow spaciousness. And that's very counterintuitive for me because it means I'm actually engaging less with stuff. I'm slowing down. I'm doing less, but what I do do, haha, <laughs> what I do do has more impact and has a bigger effect in the world. So I'm kind of learning that about myself. And Maria, you asked, did you take notice how much shit goes through your mind? How the hell do you turn that off? I don't, I don't turn it off. And yeah. And like in the early days of meditating, I would sit down with a timer for like 10 minutes and I sit down and be like, okay, here we go meditating. And then my timer would go off and I'd be like, well, that was 10 minutes of me just washed away in my thoughts. That's the practice. All right, 10 minutes. And then like over time, I'd sort of have like one moment in the middle where I'm like, oh, I'm thinking a lot. Can I come back to this moment? And then washed away. And so it's just a practice. We're just learning a little bit better each time to rise like a millimeter up out of our thoughts each time. And as we practice with that, we can get further and further. And the final thing I want to say, like you wrote, it's excruciating. And I so appreciate that, that like, uh, th that like energy, you know, that feeling about it. But there's one thing you can do is consider it's only excruciating because you have a story that it should be different. Like you have, I'm asserting you have a belief or a story about meditating that like it shouldn't be going this way. And because of your story that it shouldn't be going this way, when it does go that way, it's very like, ah, that's innervating. And instead you could just be like, oh, it's perfect. However it goes. Like if I just, if I just sit down and my thoughts are a wash for 10 minutes and I do nothing at all. And then the timer goes off. That's beautiful. What a beautiful result. And from that place, it can stop being so excruciating. It's still going to go the way it's going to go, but at least now you're not in resistance to the way it's going to go. You're just letting it go. And that allows, that really can, can make things a lot less heavy for us to work with. Hey, Brad, nice to see you, man. You call someone who's calling you about something and they say, oh, would you like a call back? And you're like, yes. And then they call you back three days later, three days later, yo, I got stuff to do. You got to, you got to work a little bit more in my schedule. So I'll call you back. You put your number in. I'll call you back four days later. I'm going to one up them. Brad writes, can you speak to spaciousness in relation to stress and stimuli? I notice a buffer and wonder techniques for awareness and support of it. Can you elaborate a little bit, Brad? I'm not, I just want to know what you mean by you notice a buffer and you're wondering techniques for awareness and support of it. I'd love to, I'd love to answer that question more fully. And I really appreciate that you brought it. Anilia says, uh, breathwork, breathwork helps me in the moment when meditating. Yeah, breathwork can be great. Sometimes I work with uh, rapé, which is a, a blend of tobacco and other sacred herbs um, when I'm meditating. Um, that's a beautiful um, plant medicine that really opens our third eye up and can bring us right into the present moment. Um, right now, I'm not doing so. Right now, I'm just meditating just with nature, just using nature to open me up. So... Brad, I'll, I'll speak to what you asked about as soon as I've, you've got some elaboration there for me. In the meantime, I want to talk about the process of integration a little bit 
And, um, and I just want to share, like, I have an agenda in these conversations, like these conversations, my podcast, all of that. My agenda is that people, um, start engaging with a coach, really. Usually that's what I'm, what I'm hoping people get from this is like, oh, there's tremendous value when I engage with a coach because then I don't have to do all the work myself. And then I don't have to like try to get out in front of all this stuff. Like for me, my mind is always afraid that I'm going to lead y'all or whoever is listening to me whenever I'm speaking down the wrong path. I'm going to be a false prophet. I'm going to be like, come this way to salvation. And then I'm going to discover, fuck, I've been leading these people the wrong way. And ah, like that's a real concern of mine because I see so much of that in the world. And so my mind wants to get out in front of that and get super busy and like, oh my God, okay, what do we do? How do we ensure that's not the case? And the beautiful thing about working with my coach is I don't have to. I don't have to get out and I don't have to second guess or try to like be thinking 30 steps ahead. All I have to do is walk in this moment and trust the support that I have in my life. And that allows me so much more latitude and freedom. I can relax into my life and I can trust, hey, it's okay. I'm going to stray from my path. There's no way to avoid that. But the beauty is I don't have to try to outsmart that. I don't have to try to figure that out because I've set up enough structures of support in my life that they'll support me to see when I've strayed from my path and come back and learn better and better how to walk that path. So I'm just sharing that because I just don't want to like pretend that's not there or be like, oh, have people be like, oh, Adam's suggesting we've got a coach once again. Yeah, that's my agenda. I think it really works to change our life. And one of the things that's kind of funny that happens is sometimes people that I've met like 10 years ago will kind of come out of the woodwork and be like, Hey, your life really seems to have taken off and your transformation seems really remarkable. Can you, uh, like, how did, how do I, how do I do that? Like, what, what did you do? What makes a difference? And I'll, I'll, they're like, I really want to make this happen in my life. I'm like, Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Just hire a coach right now, hire whatever coach you can afford, but hire a coach start engaging in this kind of relationship and make it a regular practice for yourself that you work with a coach, gain the benefit of this. And they'll go like, ah, ah, got it. And then like two years later, not working with a coach or they hired a coach. They worked for them for like two months. It wasn't very powerful. And then they gave up on the coaching. So it's okay. There's tons of coaches that aren't very powerful. Don't stay with those people, but don't give up on the coaching. Don't give up on the opportunity. Stay the course because this work works magic. So that's my agenda. Just want to be upfront about it. So there's no surprises here. People are like, what Adam Baden switched me? No, that's always the agenda here is that I enroll you in the possibility of, of getting yourself that kind of support in your life because you want to play a big game in your life. Uh, the buffet, Brad says the buffet or the buffer, the buffer, the buffer allows me to perceive stimuli stress and allow it to be without a buffer. I am triggered or raw. I see. It allows me to be with things as they arise. So the buffer may not be the, so let me see. This is what I think you're saying, Brad, is that there's sort of like life happens and then you have like a layer of kind of fat or buffer, like fat, I'm thinking metaphorically because it protects us from the temperature change in the world, but like you have a layer through which that kind of like has to pass through before it actually gets to you. And that allows you to kind of like be okay with stuff happening. So I can really relate to that. That's like, uh, one of my teachers once, he was working with Bay and I, and he was sharing like with Bay, Bay was like, I just wanna feel Adam more, which by the way, everyone always wants that, including myself. I always wanna feel myself more and so does everyone else. I wanna feel more of your heart. No fucking shit, me too. But our teacher, Bay had said that, and our teacher was like, well, Bay, you know, Adam is like an incredibly dense man. He's like an oak tree. You know, like it, it, there's a lot to go through and it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a tremendous heart. That density is there because he's got a very tender heart. And so the strategy I learned growing up was to create all of this layer of density, these many, 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 many layers. And so as stuff was coming in, it took a long time for it to get to the point where it impacted my heart. And like a meteor coming in through the atmosphere of the earth, that meteor loses material. It burns up as it comes through the atmosphere. So that by the time it actually touches down to the ground, there's not that much left. So this is fine if what you want in your life is to not be particularly impacted by life. Like if you want to go through life and not really be um, 
well, impacted, that's the word, like not be bumped by life, then having a strong buffer will allow you to do that. For me, there was a point where I was like, that is insufficient for a few reasons. I don't want that anymore. The first was, I just found life was starting to feel kind of gray, like it was losing some of its color and it felt a bit boring and a bit lugubrious. That's a good word, right? That's a million dollar word. A bit boring, a bit lugubrious, a bit like, eh, I was feeling a bit meh, a bit shruggy about it. And of course, because there's like, life is only getting into me through this huge filter. So the time it arrives, it's very like denaturized. It's very colorless, but it was safe. I knew how to handle it. I could be with what life was bringing me because it only arrived in a very small dose. It was like I was taking life homeopathic, homeopathically. You know, it was like diluted one part of life per 10,000 parts of water. So I didn't want that anymore. I wasn't really enjoying my experience of that. And then the second reason was I wanted to impact people. And if I'm only able to let people impact me one over 10,000 of what they're providing, then I'm only ever going to be able to provide that back out. And, and this is the one people really want. Leaders always want to argue with me on this one. No, 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 no. It's different, Adam. I do that to like mitigate so I don't let too much in, but I'm very impactful. I'm like, great. Well, I'm not trying to convince you of anything, but you're here talking to me because you say you want to have more impact. I'm just telling you what I see. What I see is that you are pretty protected from letting the world impact you. So why do you think the world would then let you impact it? It's going to see that protection and respond in kind. So that buffer for me was something I, I actively chose. I want to move that. I want to feel more raw and tender. And to your, what you've shared here, Brad, is, um, uh, do, 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 do. You said, can I not go any higher? Okay, fine. Whatever. I don't care. Uh, Without a buffer, you are triggered and raw. Yeah, so this is when we, that density I was talking about in myself, that's armor. And what that's doing is protecting my tender, tender, beautiful heart from being hit by the world. And if you look at life, it's ludicrous how much there is to be with. There is so much to be, there's Putin doing crazy shit. There's politics in America. There's Canada burning up. There's the person that stepped on your foot and didn't even give you a moment's thought. There's the guy cutting you off in traffic. There's the woman yelling at her child right next to you in the grocery store. All of that is happening constantly. There is so much of life to be with. And so because growing up, we're like, this is overwhelming. We build the armor. And so if we want to do the work where we are transformational, meaning we are transforming our own lives and we become the sort of person where when people spend time with us, they have their own lives transformed, then the practice is being willing to take away that buffer, that armor, and let life start to impact us. And at first, that's going to be really rocky. We're going to feel like we're missing a layer of skin and we're going to find ourselves like super tender and raw and reacting to a lot of stuff. And if you go and watch my live, like... I think it was two or maybe three weeks ago, I'm sharing a lot about how uninspired I felt and how like things feel hard and like I can't really see my own impact. And, and I wrote a post about this too called uh, Sadness and Heartbreak, if you want to look it up on my Facebook feed. And all of that is what happens when we, when we willingly surrender the armor. We are giving away our safety and we are going to feel like kind of raw and like, oh my God, I feel like I'm getting uh, calloused a little bit. That's the way to learn how to meet the world with a fuller, more open heart. And that's the way that we move to have more access to our own impact is by being willing to let the world impact us like that. And that is not for the faint of heart. It's much easier to have a layer of density there. And I don't judge anyone for having that. All I'm intending to do in this conversation is, is point to the fact that there's a choice. And there's a consequence and a benefit to both sides of that choice. Now there's better or worse than the other. Brad, you said, I find the buffers created by meditation and acceptance practice that allows stuff to flow by without feeling the need to fix. When I lose that, I feel myself putting up armor. Okay, well, it sounds like maybe I'm misunderstanding how you're describing your buffer. Like if you're saying that that's created by meditation and acceptance, then what's the, that sounds like a positive thing. It sounds like you're empowered by that. 
So uh, if your question is like, how do I get that buffer more often? And, uh, and then additionally, you're saying that it's created by meditation and acceptance practice. I'm not, probably not the best person to ask because my approach to life, like my commitment is to take away my buffer, to release that. But if you're saying, like if we just take you at, at face value and you're saying it really serves me and I get it from meditation and acceptance, well, I'd say meditate and accept. Practice doing that more. And yeah, it's a practice. So you won't just do it perfect. It sounds like all there is for you to do is to keep practicing what's working for you. Not to put too fine a point on it. But that's kind of the way this works. Uh, hey, Erica, it's nice to see you here. Uh, I want to read what you wrote. Erica writes, I feel meditating is just to pause and allow the subconscious, whatever the heck that means. I sat and stared at a tree this morning and watched four hummingbirds fly and spoke to them. That was meditating. Sit and watch my own suffering. That is meditation. Stare into the abyss, watching the chaos in my thoughts. There's no wrong way to take that pause, or so I don't feel there is anyway. I think the space in between our thoughts gets longer and longer each time. Beautifully said. I'm 100% aligned with you. You too, Grimby. Uh, and then Erica, you also write, I've worked with more than one coach for five years, many times a month, and it helps me keep going. I require lots of support. I'm so thankful for that support. I do plan to reach out to you to work some for sure. Oh, well, that's very sweet. Um, yeah, I, Bay and I are up to a lot, and we're often like... Uh, there's often these moments where we turn to each other and we're like, boy, thank goodness for all the support we have in our lives. eh? isn't it great? Like to know that we're held with this, you know, something showed up and babe was like, I think I should, I should reach out to my counselor again soon and, and book an appointment with her. And there's just another moment, you know, Bay works with a coach. We work with teachers. She works with ayahuasca. We have teachers there that we work with we all of the structure, but the more that we want to hold and create in life, that's more life for us to be with. And the more life there is for us to be with, the more we believe we require support with that. And so thank goodness for support. It is Sir Gerd, Sir Gerd. Okay, thank you for the, the comments and the questions. Brad, thanks for asking what you did, super helpful. I wanna talk a bit about integration and specifically I wanna talk about this statement that is made about ayahuasca, which is it's like doing 10 years of therapy in one week. So 10 years of therapy in one week. And that is spoken like the best way, like if therapy was really, really good, it would work in one week. That's the assumption in that claim. It's sort of like implied in it is it the best thing that could happen is for you to do 10 years of therapy in one week. And I want to invite all of us here to consider that's not necessarily the case. It's also not that it's, I'm not saying it's bad for 10 years of therapy in one week, but in 10 years of therapy, what's happening is every time you do work with therapy, assuming you're working with a good therapist, you are then going into your life and you are integrating that into your life. And you might like get a bit of awareness and then try to take a baby step in your life and then slip back. And then you come back to therapy and you get a little more awareness and you take a baby step and you step back, but you've slipped back less than before. And so compared to where you once were, you've actually grown a little bit. And so over those 10 years, you're integrating every step of the way. And um, what often happens with ayahuasca is people are met with a flood of insight and awareness and healing all at once. And that creates a tremendous amount of spaciousness. It like really removes a lot of the stuff that's been in the way that's been blocking us. We can start to be like, holy crap, I've really like I can feel a difference in me. And it's really remarkable when you see people leave at the end of this week, like their faces are so much lighter. There's so much less sorrow there. There's so much less heaviness, like whatever they were carrying. And a lot of people are carrying burden or guilt or shame or anger or whatever. It's like fallen from their face. And what's left is beauty and youth and radiance and grace and forgiveness and divinity and all of these amazing things. This is not exclusive to ayahuasca. When we pe take people down to Costa Rica in the middle of the forage for the retreat, by the end of that retreat, they look like five years younger, 10 years younger. There's a notice noticeable shift. It's remarkable. So any transformational work does this. But the thing is, once we finish that work in our ceremony, where, whatever kind of ceremony we were engaged in, now we have to go back and be with life as we left it. 
and life has had nothing to do with any of our transformation. So life, if we left it in this shape and we, we were originally in that same shape, maybe we'll do it like that. We go away and we kind of straighten up a little bit with the magic of ayahuasca or transformational coaching, or maybe Tony Robbins is your jam. You kind of like, oh, oh, my back's straight. I can do this. And then you go back and you encounter your life. And what a lot of people do is because their experience with plant medicine has been so powerful. So they're like, this is never going to go away and I don't have to worry about it. And frankly, a lot of programs kind of advocate that. Don't worry. This is locked in forever. But there's a lot of irreverence to the power we have in terms of creating our own life. And so we've left that world like that. And because we've decided nothing's going to change, we come back and we're kind of blindsided and we fall back into our old pattern. And so the process of integration is really the process of like, how do I take this spaciousness that's been created? How do I set myself up with structures that are going to support me to kind of like hold strong a little bit as I keep meeting life so that life can come and meet me in my new shape? How do I, how do I get out in front of what's likely to happen? How do I have some consciousness so that I'm not blindsided by that? It doesn't mean that it's going to be fun. I'm in that process right now and it's, I'm irritable. Like I, I'm irascible. I'm annoyed at people for doing nothing wrong. <laughs> Bay's coming into my office being cute in the morning and I'm stirring with her. Why? I don't know. It's just there. And so the integrative process is not easy. It's not, well, it's, it's not anything. It's what it is, but it's a process of renegotiation and it's a process of energetic kind of shifting. And that, that is not easy. And so when we say things, when you hear people say like 10 years of therapy in one week, you also want to hold in the back of your mind. Yeah, but you also have to then integrate 10 years of therapy. And that's going to be quite a challenge. And you're probably going to lose a lot of that, that, um, that 10 years. You know, if you've got 10 years of insight and you come back and you start to try to integrate that, you're probably going to have a lot of it kind of fizz over the sides of the cup. And that's okay. That doesn't mean any of this is wrong. But really, what I really want to do is, is sort of encourage all of us that are engaging in transformational processes to hold sacred the work that happens outside of the ceremony. In the lineage I'm taught in, we say that 50% of the work happens in ceremony and 50% of the work happens outside of the ceremony. And the same is true for coaching. 50% of the work is when the client's sitting in coaching and like creating new awareness and really being like, holy mackerel. I can see it. I never realized that everything I was doing was like ultimately rooted in self-loathing. I thought I was just trying to fix like my problem eating too much. It's all rooted in my self-loathing. This is a huge breakthrough. That's 50% of the work. But if they then go into the rest of their life and don't do anything with that, they don't practice with that. They don't change it. They don't change their behavior. They don't start to like notice themselves self-loathing and then choose something different. If none of that happens, all the work's wasted. So that's, that's so, so crucial. We have to bring that work forward into our lives. So whenever you're engaging in a process like that, really, really, really put a lot of attention on your integrative process. It's so, so valuable, so, so important. Okay, let's take a swing at a rando question. This is from Muriel, who I believe is in the Netherlands. And Muriel says, please talk, it's all in caps, please talk about uprooted people that are isolated like me and don't feel at home anywhere. Sure. So I have free reign. I can talk about these people. These people are idiots. <laughs> what a bunch of morons. No, I'm just kidding. Of course. So I would say when people are feeling isolated and don't feel like they have a home, there's a couple things that are happening. Let's talk about Victoria first. So Victoria, the city I live in, gorgeous city. Nice size, the, the downtown, sort of the metro area is about, I think, 100,000 people these, these days. Not too, too big, not too, too small, nice size. And then the greater Victoria area, which is sort of the surrounding municipalities and stuff around it, leads to a population of about 400,000 people. So it's a decent size, but it's not overly big. And if you look online, if you Google, like, how is Victoria to live in? You'll see some people are like, it's amazing. It's super beautiful, awesome culture of health, bike lanes everywhere, gorgeous ocean surrounding you all over the place. It's awesome. And other people will say stuff like, ah, it's nice, but it's very cliquey or it's very hard to, to get into or it's very difficult to like become a part of or stuff like that. And 
So what happens is people form a belief about a place. Oh, this is the nature of the place. And that belief may be to some extent borne out in reality, like every place has its own personality. But that personality does not have to be determinative at all. For example, when we get, go to France, people are like, oh, the French are quite snobby and, and, and they hate it when you speak French and, and blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Every single French person we talked to so appreciated us speaking French with them. I mean, we love speaking French and we're fluent, so that helps. But we have a Canadian accent. It's clear that we're not native speakers. They loved it. They were all so polite and so nice and so generous and so warm. What's the deal? Did we just happen to find every random French person that was nice and then all the other ones were in like a meeting called Fuck Foreigners? Probably not. That'd be a sweet meeting though. Fou les foreigners. So people hold Victoria a particular way and if they buy into that story, then they're gonna go about looking at every interaction a particular way. And they're gonna start to tell themselves other stories that align with that first story. Oh, it's cliquey, people don't want me to go to this event. And they go to an event and they kind of sit at the side because they feel like people don't want them there. And then no one comes and talks to them. And they're like, this event sucked and I didn't like it. And so on and so on and so on. Uh, merci beaucoup, Manon. It's nice to see you, Manon. Uh, uh, Manon is a Francais Canadien aussi. Uh, but she's got a much cooler accent than I do. <laughs> I, I have some friends, this is a total aside, please forgive me everyone, but I have some friends in, uh, in Costa Rica where I'm learning to uh, hablo espanol, I'm learning to speak Spanish. And I'm getting pretty good, which is cool, just from being willing to look like an idiot speaking with native speakers. And I've discovered the two most important things you can learn in any language are como se dice, how do you say, and que significo, what does that mean, or what does it mean? So I'm also slowly learning German, and in German, it would be wie Zachman, and that means, how do you say? So then I can say, wie Zachman, brother, and then they, my friend would be like, Bruder. So anyhow, I'm talking to this friend, uh, Jason, a very dear friend of mine uh, down south, and he's learning French. I was like, oh, c'est formidable, je suis très excité, I'm very excited to speak French with him. And uh, we were, I was just telling him about the difference between French French, Parisian French, and Canadian French. And the example that Ben and I always like to use is in Parisian French, the syllables are more demarcated. It's more clear where one word ends. It's still a bit confusing because in French, they kind of blend together. But so if I was to say, I want some pizza, I would say something along the lines of je veux du pizza. I want je veux du pizza, some pizza. Je veux du pizza. And then, and then as an example, we tell him, and here's how that would sound in Québécois. In Québécois, it would sound like, je veux du pizza le. <laughs> you, you just smush all of these words together, and it looks like just a jumble of letters. Je veux du pizza. So the je veux is mushed together. It's kind of spelled like J apostrophe V E maybe. Je veux. And then apostrophe D, apostrophe P, apostrophe Z, Z, A. <laughs> so it's very fun. I, I love languages. Okay, let's come back to what I was talking about. So if we have a story that a place is going to be hard to become a part of, then we will probably act in alignment with that story and we will probably make that true for ourselves. If I have a story that I don't feel at home anywhere, then I'm going to probably make that true. I'm going to probably take actions that encourage or reinforce that belief. And so the first question I always ask people like this, people will come and they'll say, here's the thing. I'm isolated. I don't feel like I am at home anywhere. And I go, do you want to feel like you are at home? And they'd go, well, here's the thing. I can't. No matter where I go, I feel isolated and I never feel at home. Did you notice that? I, we asked them the question, what do you want? And they went back to explaining the story about what, how things have to be. Got it. You feel, okay, let's make sure we're on the same page. You feel isolated and like nowhere do you feel at home. Is that right? Yes. Okay, got it. So we're clear on that story. We're clear on how you feel. Here's the question. Do you want to feel like you have a home? Well, yeah, but I can't because we'll yeah, I don't know. leave the story aside. You want to though. You want to create that. Yes. Great. Do you want to make the current place the first place you start to feel at home? Is that something you want to create? Well, yeah, but here's why it won't work. Never mind that. Do you want that? Yes. So that's the first place is that we have to come to a place where we're like, I want 
this place to feel like home. And if that is true for you, Muriel, then the next thing would be to start to notice how are you creating for yourself this experience that you are not at home? How are you creating that? So what are the things you do? What are the thoughts you have? What are the ways you act that contribute to you feeling like you don't have a home? And what are the things you would be doing if this was your home? If you already felt like this was home, what would you be doing? And the thing that we don't like, the thing that's challenging for us is that there's a, there's a process where we have to like make a leap. And the process of that leap is where all of my old stories are still alive for me. They're like, you don't belong. People don't like you. You never feel like you're at home, blah, blah, blah. So that's still how I feel. And I'm like, but I want to get over here to this edge where I do feel like I'm at home and I'm going to live as though this is my home. And the leap is where even though we feel like we're not at home anywhere, we start taking the actions that would, that would show up if we were already here. And that's how we get to this feeling of being at home. That's how we make our way over there. The thing we want is I want this feeling like I'm not at home to go away completely. And then I want this feeling like I do belong to show up completely. And then I'll start acting like that's the case. And that's not how life works for us. The way life works for us is, nope, you're going to feel this way. And this is the place you want to get to. And until you're ready to start acting in alignment with that new belief you want, that new experience, it's not going to happen. And once you do start to act that way, it's going to have you cross the threshold of your fear. And it's going to start to have things go differently. So it can be really powerful to start to notice, like, how am I creating this experience I say I don't want? How am I the one making that the, ex the, the, the experience, my life? And then what would I do if I already felt like I was at home here? And now I must start doing that. And that will start to change things. Uh, Ilya, you wrote, Ilya, is your name pronounced Ilya or Ilya? Please let me know. Where's the emphasis? Leah writes, when you feel at home and so happy alone, that's when you know you have yourself as home. My own heart is my home, my own sacred space, self-love. Yeah, for, it's, it's an interesting thing because um, our work in Costa Rica is really potent. And to be in a space where everyone is committed to, to the transformational work and to doing going deep themselves and like there's so much love and, and like we really have created a family down south. And every time we come down, they're like, when are you going to move to Costa Rica? And at the same time, we're very committed to Victoria. And, and frankly, we create home everywhere we go. That's just part of who Bay and I are committed to being. It's not free. We didn't just show up that way, but that's what we're committed to living our lives is wherever we go, we create home and community. And so, so it's an interesting thing where I feel pulled. And, and I don't want to leave my friends here and, and my family and, and the, the and in French, we would say the terroir, the terroir of where I live, the, the acidity of the soil, the feeling of the land is as much a part of me and who I am. And so we're navigating that ourselves. Um, and Erica, you're talking about uh, what we'd mentioned, that positive confirmation bias, what we seek, we find. Same with LA. If I look for bad, I find it. If I seek the beautiful, I find it. And then other times I seek the good and find dum-dums and that's okay also. Indeed. Yeah. This is, this is the part of law, uh, the law of attraction that I really take stock in. There's a lot of the law of attraction that's kind of like a bit metaphysical and starts to like, uh, I think, stop being so helpful. And I think it also kind of, um, it gives people a stick to hit themselves with. But the part that I think is so valid is the lens through which we look at the world is the is how we're going to experience the world. And so the, the best parable for this is a man walks up to a city, a gate, and there's like a homeless person in front. And he says, hey, how are the people of this of this city? I'm considering staying here for like a couple of weeks. And he says, well, how are the people of the last city? And the guy's like, oh, they're amazing, super kind, warm hearted, really lovely and welcoming. And he said, oh, you're going to find these people very similar. You're going to love it. He's like, awesome. He goes in. And then like a couple of days later, another guy comes forward and says, hey, how are the people of this city? I'm considering whether I'm going to stay here. I'm, I'm leaving my old city. And he says, oh, well, how was how were the people of the last city? He says, oh, they were rapacious and like shitty and like greedy and just out for themselves. And he's like, yeah, you'll probably find these people pretty similar to that. And it's nothing to do with the cities. You get this, right? It's, it's that that's the lens through which they look into the world. 
And so that's the world that they get. The best example of this in my life was I was raised, I noticed I needed to breathe. I need to slow myself down a bit here. I was raised with the adage, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everyone's trying to get something from you. And so guess what I never experienced in my life? Free lunches. There was no generosity, no true generosity in my life because every time someone expressed any generosity, I was looking at them with a squinty eye, like, what's the catch? What are you trying to get from me, buddy? And if you do that enough, people are going to be like, fuck that. That felt horrible giving Adam that, that nice gift. He like scrutinized it, made me feel terrible about it, made me question my motives. I'm not going to keep doing that. And so eventually, the only people that are going to bother trying to give me something are the people that are that are trying to get something out of me because they're the ones for which it's kind of worth it for them to push through that nonsense that I'm throwing up. And so there was a lot of unwinding of that for me so that I could live in a world that's truly generous. It's there already, but I had to create it for myself by virtue of changing how I was relating to and experiencing the world. I had to change my lens for that world. Um, Maria, you write, could speaking the local language be a factor in the not at home feeling? Sure, in the sense that, well, but it's all going to go back to that lens. So like I could move an hour north on the island I live on into a town called Nanaimo. And Nanaimo is going to have some different culture from Victoria. And I could be like, ah, oh, I'm not part of the local culture. And that's contributing to me feeling not at home. Once again, here's a situation where I don't feel at home. It's the same thing. So the language, like, yeah, language barrier is a real thing. We don't want to pretend it's not there. But I don't have to let that, like like I was sharing, I don't speak Spanish. I'm learning to. I just create a different context for myself to step into my life there and to hold that like a home and to be like, oh, this is so cool. It's like my relatives speak a different language and I get to go home and learn a new language. That's a different way to relate to the exact same circumstances. So the i'm not trying to pretend that these don't have a factor what i'm trying to do is is help us see i'm trying to illustrate that underneath whatever the circumstances are how we are relating to what we are experiencing is going to be the really the determinative factor more so than anything else erica you write um how can you begin now to feel at home within yourself and to see yourself and Go back to yourself so that you're never isolated and never alone. Uh huh. And Daniel, you write, immersion is better than dipping your toes in the water. Yeah, it's more fun too. But I'm I'm learning like it's classic me, but most of the Spanish I'm trying to get them to teach me are like slang. So I'm learning like uh, in Tico Spanish, Costa Rican Spanish. If if you're if if you ask someone like uh, cómo se siente or uh, cómo tú or something like that, how are you doing? One of the things you might say would be like acacheta, and acacheta is a shortened version of I think it's acacheta in flauda, which means like your cheeks inflated. <clears throat> and so what acacheta means, <clears throat> it's referring to that feeling when you're like with your family. And you've got like some really good food and you're just eating it and your cheeks a little bit stuffed up. And so we'd say like, Acacheta, like, ah, oh, this is the good shit. This is the good life. I've got a big piece of delicious broccoli or meat in my mouth. Cheeks a little puffy. Hell yeah. And so now when you in the world see a squirrel with a bunch of nuts in his cheek pocket, you can be like, ah, Acacheta. <laughs> Pura vida. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, Daniel's saying we manifest the world as we see it. That's absolutely the case. And what's so fascinating about this is we don't see that we manifest the world as we see it. So pretty much every time I get into a new conversation with a new client, there is like a period that, that goes from between one to about, about roughly three months where they share what they want and then they explain why they cannot have it. So we work to have them not tell me what they think they can get and what they think is reasonable, but what do you actually want? And then from there, great, how can we support you to create that? Well, I can't, and here's why. And during this period of like three months, my work is to invite them to keep noticing how they're creating this reality and to see the power of their beliefs and their work sort of like their, just their process, how it typically looks is them insisting, no, Adam, 
It's not my beliefs creating this. This is reality. And that happens every time. And usually over time, that insistence, that attachment to their beliefs being reality and not the other way around, their beliefs being made reality rather than the reality creating their beliefs. It's actually kind of both. Forget about that for now. Usually that starts to erode over those three months. And as that erodes enough, there's an opportunity like that, that, uh, that locked upness of that starts to diminish a bit. And then a new experience can start to be created. Then there's a little bit of spaciousness around the belief and we can start to create something different. The more successful I find people have been in their life, the more attached and entrenched they are in their beliefs. Some people are like, I want to work with clients at high rates because they're ready to do something. Oh, let me tell you, clients at high rates are super fucking attached to their beliefs because their beliefs got them that money. And so they're like, this is the way it is. Nothing can change. Life sucks. Fix it for me. And you're like, okay, well, let's take a look at what you're doing there. Sure. But all of these things you just said are wrong. And here's the truth. And you can't fix it. Fix it. <laughs> okay. Well, your beliefs here are going to win out. So do you actually want this to be different? Are you willing to believe it's possible? It's a funny world. Uh... Aliyah, you're saying I had the spiritual awakening out of nowhere in 2015. Then I found then I found ayahuasca. I went to Rhythmia in Costa Rica. Yay, Rhythmia. Eight years of pure healing daily. I've loved the self-healing journey. And the portal happened to me. I didn't even know the gateways were a thing. So yeah, this is a beautiful dream. It's all perfect. Soul progression is the name of this game. Aho, sister. Um, and Manon, you're saying you feel that your soul is emerging, or rather a new part of you is seeking to develop. Love that. I've realized that I find it very uncomfortable. For example, to be in this new me in relation to my leadership. Same here. Also, I had several behaviors that allowed me to release the pressure or even escape this discomfort. This morning, I realized that even though I desire for this part of me to emerge and unfold, it can be painful. I need to create a relationship with this new part of me. I would like to hear your thoughts on these phases of self-emergence and embracing this part. Oh, yay, yay. Thanks for that beautifully articulated in English question, Menel. And nice work you're up to. I'm just going to spill some tea on my bicep there. There we go. Um, so I can really relate. And one example that comes to mind is I was sitting in ceremony Monday, this past Monday, a week this past Monday. And I, I was sitting beside my friend who was working that evening. And I turned to him and I'm like, hey, could you, could you support me a bit? And, uh, and he's like, yeah, what's, what's going on? And I'm like, ah, you know, I'm the medicine supporting me to surrender. And there's like a bunch of, you know, expectations and things I want to have happen. And I can tell, like, I need to surrender those and I'm, I'm trying to let them go, but I'm feeling really resistant. And, and I'm just like, um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough. And he paused and he kind of sat with it for a bit and he was like gathering some stuff. He's like, Hmm, well, you might consider you're not actually resistant. And I was like, huh, well, let me sit with that for a while. And, I did. And then I said, okay, well, it does feel like I'm having a hard time being with stuff, something like I feel like I'm struggling a bit. And he's like, yeah, well, resistant is often like holding your arms out, you know, like, like that, like keeping something at bay. But it occurs like to hear what you're sharing rather than resisting something, what you're actually doing is like, like, it sounds like you're, you're conscious of what there is to do. You're being with all of this. It sounds like it's just uncomfortable. Like there's just discomfort for you in, in your process. And that's uncomfortable. And uh, I was like, ah, interesting. And then he elaborated further and shared, you know, as we go deeper into this work, resistance can become this label that we slap on ourselves that sort of allows us to get away with being a bit masochistic. If I, you know, it's like sort of you get to this level where you're like, I'm woke and I'm not mean to myself and I'm kind and I can be loving to all, but here I am being resistant. And that's the way you can, you, you can still kind of like berate yourself. You can still put yourself down a little bit. And so, so it's like, huh? So not, it's not that I'm resisting this. It's just that I'm, there's discomfort in my process. And what was beautiful about that is as long as I'm operating with a story like oh, I'm resistant and I need to like drop my resistance somehow, 
as long as that's not actually the truth, well, now I'm kind of creating this wall that I need to break down that's not actually there. So ironically, I'm kind of like, okay, how do I break down this wall that I've created is not really there? How do I make that happen? Ah, there's no wall. I don't actually have to do that. So all of that energy is actually creating its own wall. How fucking fascinating is that? I think that's amazing. And so once once he spoke this to me, I could start to like, okay, does that hold true? First of all, I'm not just going to take it at face value. Yes, it does kind of hold true. And from there, I could I could like, oh, all there really is for me to do right now is just let myself be uncomfortable. And Manon, based on what I'm hearing you describe, you know, it sounds like you're, you're conscious, you sound aware of what you're doing and what you're developing and all of these things. And it just sounds like it's uncomfortable. And all there really is to do is to let it be uncomfortable. And I know, I know it's sort of like, oh, that's all there is to do, but it's super hard. And I'm there with you because that's kind of where my process is at too right now. It's just like, oh yeah, I just got to allow myself to be in this discomfort. And that's all there fucking is. And it'd be so much nicer easier in a way if it was like well there's this mind riddle and you've got a brain lock around it and you need to solve the puzzle of what's happening because then you can unlock it and bounty will come forward and instead it's very mundane it's like nope just got to be willing to be uncomfortable <laughs> the mind doesn't like that the mind's like okay well how can we make this more complicated maybe there's like a goblin we have to summon and a flute we have to play or you know whatever no 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 none of that <laughs> so awesome awesome question Manon. i really i honor and bow down to where you're at in your process it sounds really beautiful i really i love that you're taking that on um erica you wrote that just went over my head but it's okay because i assume this recording yes indeed i think i get it what we resist pit persists what we resist pisses what we resist persists but it's not resistance it's walking through the pain yeah that's exactly right erica exactly right and if we are not actively resisting something, we're simply uncomfortable, but we have a story that we're resisting something, then we'll start to devote a bunch of energy to trying to break down our resistance. And if we're not actually in resistance, then all of that energy to try to break down our resistance is wasted energy. And, and this is a metaphor for how every human kind of gets stuck, is we're like, the problem, it, you, I hear it all the time, is the problem is this. I have to solve this. We're, we're so insistent that we know what the problem is and we devote all of our energy to the problem and that just keeps the problem there. So the metaphor I like is you're, I'm, I'm in a forest and the problem is this tree in front of me. God damn, this tree, I got to get rid of this tree. And so I buy an ax and I cut down the tree and I take two steps more. Ah, the tree came back. So now I've got to figure out how to make my biceps stronger and sharpen my ax and like, do all this stuff and ah, and I'm devoting more and more and more energy to cutting down the tree in front of me so I can move forward because I'm certain that's the problem. The problem is not that. The problem, which I cannot see because I don't have altitude and because I'm so attached to cutting down the tree, is that I'm in a forest. And if I can realize, oh, I'm just in a forest, then I can, then I might do something different. Like, oh, in a forest, maybe I just walk around the trees. Or in a forest, maybe I just go back out and then I go around the forest. So I don't have to deal with all this undergrowth, undergrowth, uh, growth, undergrowth and underbrush and all these trees, you know, whatever it happens to be. Summon an eagle, fly above the forest. Okay, let's talk about our fundamental innocence to finish up today. So I got to look up where I want to see precisely the words that I wrote. And I like this little simple one because it tends to cause a lot of well, no, or but. So the precise words are, behind every action lies innocence. Practice seeing the circumstances that prove this true. Behind every action lies innocence. Practice seeing the circumstances that prove this true. So the reason this is a trigger for people, and I don't necessarily mean a trigger like, uh, I'm offended. Or, oh my God, I feel bad about myself or that kind of trigger. I mean, trigger like it can confront people because they're like, well, but not, not someone that committed a crime, not a heinous, violent crime. No, sir. Yes, sir. Not Hitler. Yes, Hitler. So we're not going to go to the Hitler path. I'm asserting that's available. 
if you really wanted to deepen yourself into this practice that I'm that I'm speaking to, but that is a bridge too far for the vast majority of humans, and there's nothing wrong with that. So we practice with this on a small scale so that we can begin to learn to work with this medicine. So the idea of a fundamental innocence begins with the notion that people in their own minds are not actively setting out to hurt people. Like if you wake up and you're having a good day and we erased all of your past just to, for a thought experiment. So you're just like, none of your past is being brought to bear on how you show up today. None of the stories about who you are or who other people are, or how you have to get ahead or why you can't get ahead. None of that's there. You're just waking up, you're having a good day. You would be nice. You would not actively like, you know, take the air out of someone's tires. You would not step on someone's hot dog when it fell on the ground. You'd reach down and pick it up and dust it off and give it to them, whatever you do. You wouldn't cut people off in line. And our fundamental innocence works this way. We come onto this planet as beings of light. We have essential qualities like brilliance, generosity, compassion, divinity, wit, play, love, all of that sort of stuff. And what happens is that fear, fear happens. And fear tells us that some parts of you are too much and some parts of you are not enough. And the way it tells us that is based on how you're showing up, you're not going to be loved. And we, we put that together because like our uncle who we, we like, we notice they close energetically when we express our brilliance. And like, why is that? Ah, probably because that uncle learned that he's dumb. And he probably learned that from his parents who learned that they were dumb, who learned it from their parents and so on and so forth. So it's like, oh, that, that wasn't something that your uncle did on purpose. He wasn't like, I'm going to fuck this kid up. This is going to be sweet. I'm going to do a longitudinal study of 40 years where I fuck this kid up at the age of three, and then we'll see what kind of person he is at 43. That's not what your uncle's doing. Your uncle's just being their innocent self. And so you learn around people like your uncle uh, to like dim your intellect. And then you go forward into forward. You go forward into the world and you make a habit of doing so because you you discover when I dim my intellect around people that have the energy of my uncle, they seem to like me more. And so now you've created this life where you are pretty good at what you do and you're a pretty brilliant person, but in certain situations you've learned to turn down your intellect. And how that leaves you is kind of frustrated kind of annoyed because you feel like people don't really see you for how smart you are. And you're kind of frustrated because you find yourself in rooms where you're like, I'm smarter than these other people. Why am I in this room? And we could judge that as arrogant or anything, but don't, don't, <laughs> just don't. Instead, we want to hold this person that we're making up here with grace. And, and we want to, instead of judging them for that attitude or throwing like a thought terminating cliche at them, like if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to get in a new room. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great, but it does nothing to support this. It does nothing to help us see the fundamental innocence in this. So the fundamental innocence in this is this is a person who is brilliant, who learned that their brilliance was not acceptable in certain situations, and consequently devoted an entire way of being towards being okay and being loved until they got to this point where they continually find themselves in rooms around people that do not see their brilliance. And if you leave someone in this situation long enough, eventually they're going to start to feel resentful. They're going to start to feel frustrated because there's a fundamental part of who they are that is not being seen by the world. And that is what all of us crave is to be seen by the world. And so as that person sits in that resentment and it builds and it grows, it's going to morph from like a bit of sadness, maybe a little bit of resentment to like frustration to resignation and eventually to contempt. That's what happens because there's no way for this energy to get resolved because what would be required for this energy to be resolved is the person to be seen as the brilliance they are. And they've already stopped that from being possible by dimming their brilliance themselves ahead of time. So the escape valve for this is not available. And as a result, it becomes cancerous. It just kind of grows and grows and grows, it becomes contemptuous energy, frustration. And from that contempt, these people start to have very little patience or capacity to be with someone who's showing up kind of dumb. They start to really be denig denigrative, denigrative. Denigration is the word, and then whatever it, it is as a as an adverb, I guess, or whatever. They start to be shitty. There we go. I found the word. <laughs> they 
They start to be con condescending and impatient with people when they don't show up smart enough. All as a function of what they've learned to do with their own intellect and the consequence that has on them. And so once we meet this person 50 years down their soul's path, what we see is just someone who's kind of impatient and kind of condescending and kind of arrogant and kind of thinks them better than other people. And what do we do? We judge them for it. Fuck you, guy. That dude's arrogant. I don't want anything to do with them. They're just full of themselves. That's just who they are. That's how they are as a person. So all of that innocence that brought them to this point, we can't see any of it. And we are so quick to jump to our judgments about how and who they are that we don't put any energy into discovering that innocence. And so consequently, we relate to them as our judgment rather than as their innocence. And this is the most powerful part we can do with this particular medicine I'm speaking to. If I relate to you as my judgment, then it goes like this. Sophie is super fucking arrogant and thinks she's better than everyone and is condescending and arrogant. What am I going to do with that person on my team? Well, one, I could fire them. Has it gotten that bad? No. Okay. Two, I could put them in a situation. You know what? A good job for them might be one where they're not around any people. I'll just stick them in front of spreadsheets. Okay, great. Is that going to bring them further back towards their innocence? Or is it going to have them double down and reinforce where they're at? Probably the latter, right? They're not going to get any practice. They're not going to be seen for the brilliance they are. They're just getting stuffed aside. We're relegating them to a closet. Go in the broom closet. We've got a special office for you, Milton. You can have your red stapler and you can hang out in this broom closet. Or we might conclude like they're just not a candidate for leadership. They just don't have the capacity. They don't have people skills and those can't be developed. That's a predominant fucked up story in leadership. Oh, you either have soft skills or you don't. Garbage. So all of these judgments then have us relate to Sophie as a fixed object. That's the way she is. We judge her for the way she is, and then we hold her there, and there's no way she can improve. And so our work as people committed to transformation, as people committed to like healing by healing ourselves and supporting other people in their healing by being healed with them. That's how we heal people, is by me being healed when I'm with you. Not by telling you what to do, not by giving you advice, not by teaching you how to heal, that's not my work. My work is to be healed over here. So the way we support someone with Sophie is we trace all of how they're showing up back to its root, back to the light that began. So we can start to see, oh, Sophie's not doing this because I'm stupid. Sophie's not doing this because she thinks she's better than me. Sophie's not doing this because she has decided I'm an asshole or because there's shit on my tie or because of any of those reasons. Sophie's doing this because there's something getting pinged here for her. And that's something getting pinged, sometimes I can get pinged by. And who she is is brilliant. But somewhere along the line, she learned to turn all of this down. And as a result of that, of course she's showing up this way. There's no other way she could show up. This is no longer a choice by her. This is an automaticity. And so if we do that, one, I assert we can do this with everything. You can do this with heinous crimes. That I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying it's available, but don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. If you're like, hell no, heinous crimes off. There's no way I'm going to do this. This is dumb. Forget it all. Don't, don't do that. Start small. So start with the person that cut you off in traffic that you're mad at. Start with the person that like, didn't say have a nice day when they gave you your coffee. Start with your boss, who was a little bit rude and abrupt this morning when you said hi to them. Start there and start tracing this back to the innocence. And what this allows us to do is a couple of things. The first is we can see the purity of the human beings that come in front of us. And if we can see that, then we get to have a different experience of those people. We'll be able to have more compassion for them. We'll be able to love them far more and far deeply because we're seeing so much more of their depth. So we're loving the entirety of their depth rather than loving like, oh, here's someone who's shitty having a shitty day. I love them. That's a shallow version of love, right? So we can have that. We start to not take the way people are showing up so seriously. It doesn't impact us so much. We don't take it so personally because we're like, oh, it's all good. I mean, I didn't like that. I feel kind of bad, but I can recognize that's not born out of malice. That's not born out of them being a bad person. It's just, that's, that's their process. That's where they're at. And the third and most important and most valuable about all of this is that if we can do this with other people, we'll start to have space for ourselves. 
And then, oh my God, then we can really heal because we stop making it so meaningful when we do something dumb. When I make a mess, I can just be like, oh man, I was innocent. It's not what I would do now, knowing what I know. I'm not going to go out and do it a second time. But like that thing I just did, that's okay. I did my best and, and it went the way it did. And now I'm going to clean it up so that things can go differently. And that's freedom. That's healing, transformation, and freedom that becomes available from there. So it's, in my opinion, this is arguably one of the most valuable, potent pieces of medicine we can work with if we're committed to transformation in our own lives and to supporting others in transformation. And the more we can start to see this, the more the world heals because we start to see the world as it is rather than as it's presenting. And so I really make this a practice that I engage with certainly in my own life, certainly around my friends, certainly with like acquaintances, but also like around the things that are triggers for me, like politics. I'm not really interested in politics. People complaining about politics. I'm even less interested in people complaining about politics than I am about politics. Putin, climate change deniers, etc. whatever your hot buttons are. I take this sort of stuff and I do my best to work with this medicine so that I can, I can relate to them a bit differently because if I start to relate to them differently, my experience of them starts to change. And if my experience of them starts to change, then my experience of life starts to change. And that lets me catch my breath, take it easy, relax. It's good medicine. So that's our fundamental innocence. That's how we can trace that back. The, I, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't say this to plug my book, but I'm going to plug my book anyhow. Um, who do you think you are? Look at that. Can I look at this? Oh, no, I can look like this. Yeah. Oh, what are you? Who do you think you are? Head. Um, this book I wrote does a lot to support you to be able to trace back particular ways of showing up to the light behind it. So, for example, today we were talking about brilliance and dumbing down and condescension and arrogance. But like one of the things that who do you think you are supports you to do is like you could take something like selfishness. Oh, this person's so selfish. Well, guess what? That's a reflection of the generosity. And this book guides you all the way back so you can kind of see, oh, here's how generosity got to selfishness. And what's really cool about that is when you start to be around people that are selfish, you start to, instead of being like fucking selfish person, you start to be like, oh, this is a person who's generosity. And then what's really cool is we can start to acknowledge them for their generosity in the midst of them being selfish. And when we do that, the whole world fucking changes. It's so cool because these people start to feel seen for the thing they're desperately hoping to be seen as, but don't know how to ask for it. Don't know how to let it in. And you just become someone that gives them that gift. That's so transformational. Uh, Erica, just right now, I didn't know you had a book. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's been out almost a year now. Uh, I think it came out last September. So um, it's called Who Do You Think You Are? You can find it on Amazon. I'll put a link right here. Let me do this. AQ Books. Pow. Pow. There it is. It's awesome, I think. I even put, uh, there's like a lot of cool graphics we put in. Like, look, there's a little Superman tie guy. So we, I did a lot of work to make this kind of fun and interesting to look through. And, and one of the things that's super cool, we've got some quick reference guides. So this is where you can kind of like shadow aspects here. I'm just going down. So controlling and controlled. And then that leads you, oh, that's someone who is adventurous. Or... Uh, Rigidly following rules. Oh, that's curiosity, but that's been turned down. Or here we've got someone who's uh, like a complete hypocrite. What kind of light is that? It's integrity. So you can kind of use this at the back to trace it around. And we've got a whole section of the book devoted to helping people practice in their lives, all of that sort of stuff. So it's super cool. And if you read it, I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on it, how it lands with you. I'm really proud of that piece of work. I think it really is a good book. Okay, I'm going to bring Grimby over for the Grimby goodbye. Are you ready for the Grimby goodbye? What's happening? I'm sleeping. What is this bullshit? Oh, my God, I'm tired. What's that? Right there. Look. Yeah. Oh, okay, goodbye. I'm sl- Can I go back to my bed? <laughs> okay, Grimby says, have a good, good weekend. What's up, Obs? Good to see you. Thank you, everyone, for coming and hanging out. Super, super grateful for your presence in my life. These lives are always... A little walk on the wild side because I'm like, is anyone going to show up? Because when it when no one shows up, it's lonely. And when you all show up, you know, Erica, Leah, Manon, Michelle, 
who else do we have? A bunch of awesome people. Uh, I want to give a few more shout outs. Uh, Daniel, Seth, Maria, when you guys show up, it, it really like, it brightens my day. It brings light into my life. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your contribution to me. And thank you for being a part of this work that we're doing to support the world to shift, to shift over to one of healing and transformation. Have a friggin' awesome weekend. Uh, it's a long weekend. Enjoy your Labor Day, and we'll talk to you all next week. Laters.